So we're going to talk about preaching Jesus. Last week we talked about preaching Jesus. What does it look like to, to declare who Jesus is and how Jesus met your story? Aren't you thankful that Jesus came into your story? Yes, I'm so thankful. And that everyone here, you have a story of Jesus, not just your story, but God encountering you. We talked a little bit about maybe the woman at the well and, and how whole towns heard, not because you had all the scripture memorized, but because you had a testimony. You had a testimony of God's goodness. So preaching Jesus. Jesus is God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus, not to condemn it, but so that through him there could be life. So that there not only could be life, but things Things could be not just made right, but where there was once sin, it was, though it was scarlet, now you're white as snow. So that there now is nothing between you and the Lord. And so um, we're going to talk this morning about er- preaching Jesus, everyone in the house. It starts in the house. It starts in the house. You can't go, it doesn't go out the outside, but we're going to read this and then we're going to teach this, all right? So it says this, it says Matthew 5, 4, uh, 5, 5, 14 through 15, you are the light of the world. Somebody say, I am. I am. So it, pastor's not the light. Beyond church isn't, like the organization isn't the light. You are the light. You're the light. I'm the light of the world, okay? Uh, a city is set on, that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Men do not light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it gives light to everyone in the house. Now, uh, I, I, we're going to get into this maybe a little bit later, but I can tell you, you can light a candle, and uh, you can light a candle, and it, you might not put a bushel over it, because how many of you know, like, we're not going to put a bushel over a light? You're like, yeah. But we might maybe put a partition. You know what a partition is? It, they, they have them at work. They're called cubicles. In this room, there's cubicles right now. Oh, it's all open, but there's cubicles. There might be a cubicle right here between Philip and Mona because of something. There's a wall. Maybe, maybe not, but I'm sure that it's happened before. Maybe there could be a, a cubicle or, or wall that goes, I mean, walls, are, they, go up. they go up. They go up. There might be a wall right here. There might be a wall right there. There, there might be walls where there were, you won't put a but we won't put a bushel over it, but walls. Can I tell you? You put up a wall, you put up a wall, you put up a wall. That light's not seen anymore. It's not seen by one another. It's not seen by others. And so he says this. He says we know the message of Jesus cannot be carried outside of the house or beyond the four walls. We talk about this a lot beyond church, beyond the four walls. But can I tell you? As long as you have walls. You won't be carrying, you're going to be this little light of mine, partition, partition, partition. I'm going to let it shine inside my walls, even though I'm going beyond the four walls. I'm telling you, walls are a big deal. They're a big deal to God, and it's why God sent Jesus to tear down a wall. And we're going to look at that in Scripture here. He said, we know the message can't be carried outside the walls without first being inside. We take seriously Ephesians chapter 4, 11 through 12, which tells us it was he who gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the works of ministry and to build up the body of Christ. The next paragraph talks about this, but I'm going to say it. The works, the works. We're not, here to pra- we're not here to listen. We're here to hear and to practice. Like, if you and I come and all we are is coached, but we don't actually put the ball on the floor and work on, and even though I'm dribbling it off my foot, because how many of you know, some of the times, even when you don't try to, you dribble it off your foot. I mean, I, how many of you ever have that as a dad? You don't, you try not to, you try not to, not talking about basketball here, but maybe you're raising a kids, and you're trying not to do what you don't want to do. You know not to dribble off your foot, but somehow, in the midst of whatever's going on, you dribble it off your foot. This is why we come to church, and we come to a church on a team where I'm not, hopefully, hopefully, I don't get attacked by the ones I'm practicing with. Because it starts in the house. It starts in the house. What happens in the house, we are equipped, but we're not only to be equipped, we're, we're, we're we're to develop and this is why it's so important for serving and giving and all these kind of things. If I can't give to those that I love or those that I'm called with and connected with, if I can't give in that way to family, I sure as heck am not going to be out doing that in the world. 
If I can't walk two mile, a mile and two and give you my jacket, I sure am not going to see somebody on the side of the road or in Walmart and offer them something that I have. It's not going to happen. Why? Because I haven't put that into practice. And so we're talking about preaching Jesus. Everyone, everywhere. I'm really highlighting this morning on everyone. Like everyone meaning all. Everyone meaning everybody. But it really it means the whole. The whole. It's important that there is a whole. Even though we got lots of people in here, God designed the body to be whole. To not have walls and not to, to not be divided and not to have partitions between us and not to have partitions between us and the Lord. This is so the, 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 the ministry of, uh, that God has given in the fivefold ministry gifts that you see. Pa- 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 Pastor T, okay, you understand. We're not going to try to. Blah, blah, blah. It, it is there to equip and to help you and I uh, be equipped and to put into practice just like a coach. Can I tell you that a, a coach, um, I, I remember playing a college basketball. And uh, there was one of our coaches, he was a good ball player, but he was maybe a little past his prime. Um, but it was amazing to me how good of a shooter he still was. Like he could pull up and he could just hit the shot, you know. Just, and he had kind of had this one foot in front of the other like they used to teach it, you know. Um, so it just it was amazing. But did I, can I tell you, he didn't always make the shot, even when it was uncontested. And it's the same way for a, a, a pastor or a teacher or for any, it, the, there's an equipping and a teaching, even if you say, okay, here's what you're going to do, boys. And I remember, you know, you ever watch them like trying to teach you, maybe you had this happen in the coach and maybe you're, you and your buddies are on the end, a baseline and you kind of giggle because coach is going to go make a layup and he misses the layup or whatever it might be. You're like, hmm, yeah, okay, whatever. But you get the point. You get the point. Anyway, so let's keep it going here. Um, these are to equip the saints for the works, works, underlined circle of ministry, and to build up the body of Christ. God doesn't require perfection, but he does require growth. God doesn't require you and I to be perfect, but he does, he says, let's, let's, okay, you saw you dribbled off your foot? He doesn't just make an excuse for that. He says, all right, grab that ball, let's get it again. Let's go again. Let's go again. Okay? We assemble to be strengthened and equipped through the teaching and exercising of the word. You know, it's amazing when, when you and I make a mistake, how the word of God is able to bring correction, encouragement, rebuke, all of, whatever it might be, help, all these kind of, but yet it's so good. It's so right. It, it, what it does is, is I dribble it off my foot out of bounds and the time on the clock, you know, and coach gets me up and puts me back in the game and says, here, this, we're going to draw this play up for Nate. This is, how, this is how he deals with you. I'm going to draw this play up for Ben. Like after you dribble it off your foot, I'm going to draw it up for Ben. After you dribble it off your foot, Zolly, he, he says, all right, come on. Okay, okay guys, we're going to draw this play up. Okay, you're going you're to fake here, and Zolly's going to come around the corner. You're going to give it to him. Well, yeah, but I just missed it. Yeah, we're going to come around the corner, for, and we're going to, he just puts us back in. Yeah. It's the most amazing thing how God, in the midst of you dribbled it off your foot and you're not the one that's supposed to take the shot, give it to somebody else. He says, no, I know you can. It's so cool. God is so amazing. He, you, you want to you, and you want to do it. And what happens is when he does that, there's something where you just are like, I'm, I, okay, coach, for, I'm, I'm doing it for you. And, and I, everything you do, you're doing for the glory of God if you hear his word. This is why it's so important to hear his word. Because today, like his word's going forth. And today, I'm telling you, there's going to be some walls torn down in relationships. There's some enmity or, 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 or a division or, or a partition that's been erected in different places that it can't be anymore. It can't be anymore. And, and the Bible says, we're going to look at this, but I'm going to start it off because I want you to see this the whole time. I want to take uh, Ben. I want you to, uh, and, and Landon. Um, ben, you can go stay right here. Uh, so Lan- uh, Ben Piersek, everybody. <laughs> Youth pastor buddy, fellow Minnesotan. All right. Now Moot turned to Arkansas. Hey, shoot, we match. All right. Okay. So uh, we're going to put you over here. And then uh, this is Jesus right here. Okay, he understands. He understands. But the Bible tells us that there is um, one mediator. So he's, this is the mediator. Well, you can put it wherever you want. 
But I, he, I don't know if you understand there. He kind of shaded. Right here. So you're the mediator. Come, let's move closer. Okay? And you're the mediator. There's one Bible says there's one mediator between God and man. Okay? And so, in other words, one that, that's a go-between. And, um, and because he, there's the mediator, he, he, and he not only mediated, but he brought unity and, and co- connection or correction or tore down the wall. You remember when the veil tore? He tore down the wall, the separation. And now, like, the sanctuary. Isn't it interesting how we go into a sanctuary? Everybody goes into the sanctuary. But here we have, we have a mediator. So, so, Ben, you shot my buck. Oh, I shot his. That, that, that did happen. But you shot at my, from my deer stand. Okay? And then I shot it. It's true. It happened. Thanksgiving morning, years ago, okay? And I'm like, oh, you shot my buck. I knew I should have been sitting in that stand. And then I shot his buck, the one that he shot at. And anyway, all right. Um, but th- there's something happened, okay? And so this is the go-between. Hey, Jesus. Because, you know, we like to talk to a lot of other people. But let's, let's, let's go back to here. Hey, Jesus. Blah, 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 blah. And what is Jesus going to do? If, if Jesus is the mediator between us two, it's, it's amazing. If, if he's the mediator, the go-between, it's amazing what he'll do to take my hand, come on, Jesus, uh-huh, and bring it back together. But he, see, here's the thing. Jesus can talk to me because of what he paid the price for me. And he can say, as the mediator, he can say, do you remember this? And do you remember how I dealt with you here? And do you remember what I said? And do you remember what I did? And I say, yeah. And so now it makes this, this there's this move. You're right, you're right. And it, it brings me here. But he also talks to him, and he tells him about what's going on. And it moves us together. And it's not a work of man. It's a work of God as the one who came in between us and between us and dealt with the, the fraction and dealt with the junk. And when I see the, how he dealt with me, and he remind, as the go-between, as my mediator, it, it moves me back into this place where I can come back. Okay, thanks, Jesus. Thanks, Ben. It's important that we understand that there is a between us. And it's not a partition. It's not a partition. It is a way. It is a way. It's a way. It is the way. It's the way back. Can I tell you that, that, that when you and I see and recognize and we have a God talk with Jesus, he'll remind us of how much he, we were loved and how much we were forgiven and how much he didn't count our trespasses against us and how much, I'm telling you, Let's keep going. God doesn't require perfection, but he does require growth. We assemble to be strengthened and equipped through teaching and exercising the word, to not only preach the message, but live it. You were created for good works. God designed everyone to preach the message of Jesus to the world. Beyond Church is a body of believers continually equipped for works of service who build up the body of Christ by preaching Jesus beyond the four walls. Preaching Jesus. Uh, If Jesus isn't within the walls... Let me just say that then he's not going outside these walls. And if Jesus is in these walls, what you'll find is there's a whole lot less walls. I thought about a card deck and building a card. It would just sort of took me a little long, and with worship, it might have fallen over. So I was like, but you know, have you ever seen that where you kind of build the, you know, put one up and then one up, and you can kind of, and it's like all of a sudden you build, you build out, you build these all these walls, but yet someone can come by and go, and. That's just what that I believe God wants to do. All right? Let, let's go. If you have your Bibles this morning, let's jump over. We're going we're gonna to jump into Psalms 133, 1 through 3. It's all of Psalms 133. It says this. <clears throat> again, everyone in the house, everyone, a whole, everyone, meaning all. We're, we're called together. We're called to be whole. We're called as, as an all. Everyone, meaning every person, but together. It says this, Psalms 133, Behold, verse 1, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell in unity. Have you ever been there where just things are unified? Like there's laughs and there's things. It's like so good, right? It's completely opposite of strife. 
you know, when there's, like, when you're in the same room and you're really close, but you're really, like, miles apart, like, that's just the worst. You just, ugh. It's actually, like, the, the, like if, if peace is the atmosphere of God, the peace of God, strife would be, like, just the, the, the manifest presence of the devil. If peace is the manifest presence of God, like, peace of God, the wholeness, right, glory heavy with all things good, strife would be the manifest presence of the enemy. And so he says it's so good to be in that place. I mean, you, we, we've experienced it in marriage. We've experienced it with our kids or it's relationships. Maybe I'm the only one. No? Okay. Um, but he says how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron running down on the edge of his garments. In the, I love this, 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 this portion where we're hit on. It's like the dew of, of Hermon. Descending on the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing of life forevermore. I think about, I think about the dew, not only the watering, um, but the, the, the dew that, the, that is on the mountains. There's something about the streams that come out of the mountains because there's moisture up there. How many of you, if you've ever been to Colorado, there's, there's these rivers that are, but what are they from? They're from, there's higher levels of moisture up in the mountains, and that moisture condenses. And when it condenses, not only does it make the hills green, okay, it makes that which is below. It says, it, it says that it actually descends where? Where does it descend? It says, descends upon the mountains of Zion, like the, like the dew of Hermon, descending on the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commands his blessing evermore. Where, where the, where, I'll tell you, uh, this is the way the Lord showed it to me. Unity is key to the harvest below. Like where there's where there's unity, there, there there's moisture and moisture. There's a flow and there's a flow not only in the house, not only on the mountains, but there's a flow from the mountains that goes down below and it goes into your workplace. It goes it goes down. If there's not river, if there's not a river that's flowing down, then then guess what? There's not life below. If there's not a river, if there's not unity in the, in the house, if there's not dew, if there's not water and, and togetherness in the house, then guess what? There won't be a flow of life or the life of God down below to the world. Let's say it that way. I don't mean the world is below. I'm talking about the principle of how water flows. Okay? So unity in the church is key to harvest in the world. Ultimately, is the harvest about you and me going, oh, afraid we'll notch the belt there. Got another one for the kingdom. <laughs> no, not at all. What it is is about the message of God and man being reconciled. That there is no longer enmity or, or something between them and God. Like the, the simplicity of God loves I know it sounds crazy, but that God loves you and using the word of God to declare to them who he is. John chapter 13, 35 through 30, or 34 through 35. A new commandment I give to you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you also must love one another. By this. By what? How you love one another. By this. Circle, underline, circle, star. By this, by what? This circle, draw the line back with the arrow. Smiley face. I don't know what you got to do, but I mean, we did, used to do this in English class. And I know they don't do that anymore because they have computers, but we used to have to under, double underline this, circle this, blah, blah, blah. This is pointing to this. This, this. this adjective is pointing and describing or this, or this verb is describing the action to well, go back up. To, we had to figure this out. What this? What is it? What is it? By this? By what? By our love for for the world, for one another. So it really does start in the house. The blessing of the Lord is commanded in the house, so it can go out. If if, if we, we we as we're talking about when we bring when we have been bringing our tithes and offerings. We've been having a declaration that our lives would bring increase to the kingdom of God. Can I tell you, if increase is not in your house, you'll be limited. If peace is not in your house, what are you, how are you going to bring peace to somebody? If, 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 your, if your life is just filled with stress and toil and, and everything is just, in a sense, hellacious, um, don't 
kid yourself and think that you can come and just manifest peace. Could you manifest a joke, maybe? Could you, could you help? Yeah, but there's something about a flow that the Bible talks about. Out of your bellies is a flow. Okay, let's go here to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. So you and I, he says that there's a play, in unity, in, in unity there's a blessing, there's a flow. That it, it, God commands his blessing there. It's our love by this. We're going to love for one another that the world would know we're his disciples or they would see something different. Ephesians 4.1, it says this, and this is New King James. Uh, it says, I, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling for which you were called. If you're anybody in here reading out of the King James this morning, anybody still got the King James? Anybody? We got one, two, three, King James. Anybody else? Come on. If I, get, I can get five, six, seven, eight. Okay, that's awesome. What does it say in yours? Walk worthy of the, the, the vocation. To walk worthy of the vocation. Well, what, what's, your, what's your vocation, JR? What's your vocation? Yeah. Your vocation? Okay. He's a cattle broker. Okay. A vocation. Sorry. I, I, a vocation. A job. But it, that word job, it's not just vocation. It's not just calling. It's that which you were summoned to. It, that's the word. Walk worthy of that which you've been summoned to. I, he says, I beseech you. I beg of you. I, I'm, I'm coming to talk with you. As Paul, and you've got to understand Paul, who is one who operated as, as what we saw in Ephesians chapter 4, when we were reading about as an ap- apostle, right, to teach, to equip the saints. And he's saying, hey guys, I'm, 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 I'm appealing to you. I'm making an appeal to you that you and I, that you would walk worthy of the vocation or the, that which you were summoned, okay? So... There's got to be a way to walk worthy of it. So he says, we see you walk worthy of the calling which you were called or that to which you were summoned. Let's, let's talk about the calling that every person here has been given. Let's turn here to 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 21. This is the, the ministry. Can I tell you you're called to the ministry? There's a ministry, and ministry means this, uh, specifically the word ministry that we're going to hit in in 2 Corinthians when it talks about the ministry of reconciliation. It it specifically refers to a spirit-empowered service guided by faith. So you are a ministry, this is right out of the Strong's. That word ministry refers to spirit-empowered service guided by faith. So, so, so when you and I are going to somebody, to ministers to somebody, we don't, we don't look at what we see. Because how does faith come? By hearing and hearing the God's word. Aren't you thankful that people, or maybe somebody said to you something that you couldn't see in yourself? That somebody spoke the word of God into you and you heard what God said over what you saw? And so if I'm going to be a, a minister, I, I, I'm going what, what, to be empowered by the spirit and guided by faith. Okay, guided by the word. So 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 21. So from now on, we, we regard no one according to the flesh. Although we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. So he's trying to get a, a people to not look at people like this. Just with these eyes. Just only with these eyes. And even, can I say this, even yourself in Christ. Like I don't have a Christ suit that I can see. But it looks good if I can see it. And so he says, we don't regard or look at people according to the flesh. Therefore, if anyone's in Christ, we've maybe quoted this a few times, he's a new creation, right? He's a new creature. So when I got born again, if I, when you got put on Christ, when you gave your life to Christ, I, I was made new. But you can't see a new Nate. But there is a new Nate. Right. And this is why it's so important for us to understand spirit, soul, and body. You are a spirit, you have a soul, you live in a body. This will, this will one day lay down, and I'll put on a glorified body. My soul will go with me. Okay? When he talks about wiping tears from eyes in heaven, uh, that means you had some memory. So you're going to take some with you. Can I, can I pause and, and just talk to myself for a moment? Something that was said to me years and years ago. There's only two things you can take with you. People and memories. Take lots of both. Take lots of both. Not a savings account. 
Oh, I'm not saying you shouldn't have a savings account. No, the Lord says your, 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 your basket your, your, and your barns, okay, will be filled with plenty. But can I tell you that he is the source? And, he, it, it, it's, and it's not your barns that's your source? Because those barns could burn tomorrow. They'll burn, they could burn tomorrow. If you, how much money you have in your stock market, it could crash. Just wanted to be the bearer of good news. That God supplies your needs. That's the good news. The one who's the same yesterday, you got something stable. You got something that's immovable. You got something that remains, and it's him. And so if we would recognize that, then, then and I say, I got these kids. And even, and let me just pa- pause for just for a second, because um, it just seems like this is important right now. I was uh, with Pastor Willie George this l- last week, and uh, for a, a couple of days at a, little, a pastor's retreat, there was eight other pastors there, and it was just like he kind of a God talk where he just taught four things that were his life messages and maybe for a couple, two and a half, three hours in the morning and then in the evening. So you would, till noon, like you'd eat, then you'd teach and then you'd eat. And it was like, how can you eat three times a day and just all you're doing is sitting anyway. And then, uh, and we had one full day only there. And then he took us around tour in the, uh, the ranch or whatever that he has uh, that he loves just being outdoors, hunting and all that. And, um, and then go back and teach, and then teach, and eat, and teach. And Anyway, one of the things that he talked about, uh, and he didn't, it wasn't a life message, but it was something that picked up, and it just popped up in my heart, is this. In Jerusalem, uh, and, I, and I'm not bringing direction for you to give everything away, okay? Make this very clear. But in Jerusalem, this is the only place that he directed the church to give everything away, the church of Jerusalem. Can I tell you that right this was the direction of the Lord. Remember they sold things, had all things in common. Remember they met and how, all, how, how that church functioned. They functioned under the direction of the Holy Spirit. Can I tell you that just in very few years that everything that they would have had would have been taken from them? And so to advance the gospel, they all in, all hands, all in mentality in that moment because they were, Jerusalem was sieged, burned, and ransacked. So people that had barns and didn't use that, can I tell you, when they got conquered by Rome, it was gone. And so that was a directive from the Lord for that place to, 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 to see the gospel brought forth. Can I tell you, you, can't, you don't just live by what somebody else is doing. You live according to what the Lord is saying. And if you'll trust that, like, and the Bible says this, that when a, when a man's eye is good, what, what good means is generous. His whole body is filled with light. So he sees, he sees like how God's going to provide. Can I tell you, the Bible says that, the, but a man who's stingy, he, he, his eyes are filled with darkness and he does not receive the wisdom of God. So how you and I see, if it's dark or if it, 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 that's because I'm stingy. If it's good or I'm generous, I'll be filled with light. And I'll see that there's more from where that came from. There's more from where that came from, from the Lord. Okay? And so again, two things you can take with you. People. And memories, okay? And I, I just felt that was for even a dad in here that you've been trying to just keep everything, trying to preserve for the future. Can I tell you, um, your kids are only going to be this big once? Okay. Can I tell you, from having a 19-year-old, we'll look back at the pictures from 15, 15 years ago and so glad we did that little time or did that, whether it was to an apple orchard or to whatever it might be. It, it's all within relative in your means, Right? I'm not saying go break the bank, but it might be for somebody. There you go. All right. So, uh, so from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Although we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Verse 18 in 2 Corinthians 5. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave unto us the ministry of reconciliation. I want to define reconciliation. It's simply this. Exchanging his righteousness... For our guilt. This is the ministry that he, God has given everyone in the house. So this is that mediator, isn't it? His righteousness for my shortcomings. So what he, he, this is what he's given to you and me. A ministry that, it, that I'm supposed to tell somebody else, listen, hey, God loves you and he forgave you. And he forgave you and it's his righteousness for your sins. I can't carry that message if I can't do that here. 
I can't tell the world. I can't tell the world it's his righteousness for your sins when I'm holding somebody else's sins against them. How am I going to tell somebody that, oh, God forgives you, but I, but I don't. You can't carry that message. He says that it's your love for one another that's going to allow people to know or to hear or to receive your message. So this man, it matters. It matters who's between us. It matters that we understand that we have a ministry or we have a spirit-empowered service that's guided by faith, which is exchanging his righteousness for our guilt. Or that, so that's what we're doing. That's the, this ministry. All this is from God, verse 18, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting, not counting men's trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are the sent ones, or Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you, on the behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Like, take on his righteousness for your sins. Be reconciled. Be made right. Be back together. Be back in unity. Can I say that? Be back as a unit. God commands his blessing there. There's presence there. You know, can I tell you, in heaven, what the blessing and what the rejoicing is about? It's not about streets of gold or pearly gates or jasper on some walls. It's that he's there. Can I tell you that they're around the throne and saying, wow, wow, wow. Can you imagine what it would be like if we got to heaven and he wasn't there? terrible. It's the fact that he's there. Can I tell you, he dwells in the place where two or three are gathered in his name. Can I tell you to put on his name? You're going to have to put on his righteousness. And if I put on his righteousness and you put on his righteousness, all I see is righteousness. I see righteousness. I see righteousness. I see righteousness. I don't see what you didn't do. I don't see what you did do. I don't see how you talked to me, how you didn't talk to me, or what you did to that person, or what you didn't do to that person. As a matter of fact, I'm not making any judgments at all. I'm not making any judgments at all. Excuse me. You see that carpet flipped up right there. Stumbling over some things. You know how we stumble over some things? Hey, Kyle, what do you think about this? What do you think about what that happened there? Well, I don't really think about that at all. I don't think about that. Because I, I actually, I, I haven't been granted the right to think about that. Because there's one judge. So when we make the call, what we're actually, let's just put actually into terms what's happening. I'm making a sentencing. When I make the call, so what do you think about how they did that? What do you think about how he didn't do that? What do you think about the way that they're doing this? What do you think about how they're, they're, they're showing up this way? How do you think about they're not showing up? What do you think about how, what do you think? Well, when you think about it, you're going to think in the vanity of your mind instead of going to the mediator and recognizing, wait a minute, I have no thought on that because my thought would be sentencing or casting judgment, sentencing. Where I have, and where there's sentencing, I expect judgment. I expect penalty. And, I, and the, the crazy thing is I expect somebody to pay for something that I couldn't pay. Yeah. And so I'm hypocritical. And, 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 and we all say this, everyone hates a hypocrite. And the problem is, when we're hypocrites, we don't like ourselves, and we are shut up from the message that we were supposed to carry. How can you carry a message that you, you, you can't live with yourself? You hate that. Like this morning, I'm having to teach a message. I was telling Eva on the way here, it's like, I'm teaching a message. It's like the enemy likes to come for the word, Right? I, where I dribbled the ball off the foot. You're going to hear about a couple scriptures where I dribbled the ball off my foot. And i got to teach that this morning. Jesus, take the wheel. Rebuke, correct. Ah. And, and it's with my family. Thank you, Lord. So if we're going to walk worthy of the calling, what's the calling that you and I are called? Ministry of reconciliation. Okay. To be reconciled back to God. That's your and my ministry. And he says in Ephesians 4 verse 1, he, he says, I beseech you to walk worthy of that call. Let's go back and see how to walk worthy of that call. There's a way for you and I to walk worthy of that calling, that summonsing, that job, that ministry to which all of us have been called. Let's go back to Ephesians 4, picking up in verse 1, and we'll read through. 
I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, Paul, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling which you were called. With. With. Mm. With. Circle. With. With what? With all lowliness and gentleness. With long suffering. Forbearing with one another in love. Or bearing with one another in love. Endeavoring, so this is, again, this is with, this is walking worthy. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Is, there's one body, one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of us all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So can I tell you where there's divisions, when we're of one accord, we're to be of one accord, it's demonic. And there's a, the wrong breath is, is being listened to. And so the, while we come together, this is, the greatest, this is the greatest place to practice church. To take a message beyond the four walls. How do we do that? We do it with lowliness and gentleness. If we have a conference, how many of you, we, we're going to have a, a gentleness conference. <laughs> Can I tell you, it takes more strength not to crush something when it's within your power to cut and to crush and to punch. Can I tell you, the, the weakest men are those that hit to express themselves. The weakest moment, that's when you're the weakest, is when you lose, you lost control, the strength that you had. No self control. Meekness, lowliness, this, and this is where it starts. It starts with all lowliness. This is the biggest, this is probably the, with the way it starts here, with lowliness. One, if you were to have a different translation, it would say meekness. It's not weakness, it's meekness. Understanding and having, a, not, not that you would be low of yourself, but you would hold others in high esteem. And so because you, don't, you don't call yourself less to call somebody else more. You just call them more. You acknowledge who God says you are, that you must be pretty priceless. The Bible actually says that, like, all, that there is no price on one soul. That's just Nate's paraphrase. But there, there is not a price that could be paid in all of, in all of the money of, of, of the, the, um, the ages, the, the universe, for the price of one soul. The only thing that could pay it was the blood of Jesus. So that means you're pretty valuable. It means I'm pretty valuable. And so I'm pretty valuable, but can I tell you, if I would see this, that you're that valuable? It changes how I treat one another. Okay? So, uh, endeavoring to keep the, uh, so with all holiness, long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, all the way down. Let's go jump to verse 7. But each one of us, Grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gifts. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. So what does this mean? He just means this. He gave you a grace. He gave you a grace to carry out the call. So you've been given a ministry of reconciliation. You're going to do it and walk worthy of it with all lowliness, with meekness, with walking in love, but also understanding that what you're carrying was given from God when he took captive that which was taken captive of us. He took some things back and he gave them to you and me. He gave gifts to you. So there's a grace of God on your life to carry out your call. It's not in your own strength. It's not in your own way. There's a grace. Can I tell you there's a grace to walk in love? Can I tell you there's a grace to be a dad, to be a husband, to be a mom, to be a friend? There's a grace to be that. Let's keep going here. Ephesians, we're going to jump down to Ephesians 4, 31 through 32. So, um, I actually am going to jump in, 30, or in 29, and then you can pick up with me on 31. It says, verse 29, So let no corrupt communication or word proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good uh, and necessary for edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Verse 31. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God forgave you. Wow. Where, how, how, do I, how, do I, how do I walk in, in love? To, where I have malice, what do I do with that? Put it away. 
How do I put it away? Because I, I put it away when I see how much God has loved me. And we could go to the parable about the one that was forgiven of much, right? Who loved much. And the one that, he, you know, he held this against, he held that against the guy that only owed him a little bit. He owed the king a huge, a huge debt. The king forgives him, and he still makes him pay. But, we're, but what, do we, what do we do? We get rid of all bitterness, verse 31. You get rid of the wrath. You get rid of the anger. You get rid of the clamor and the evil speaking. You put it away from you. You put it away. And say, this is where you, the same thing where there's sin. Can I say, can I t- say this? How God put your sin under the blood, can I tell you, you can put another sin under the blood? How God put your sin under the blood. It didn't just pay for your sins, it paid for all of man's sins. So, so Ben, JR, you, you sinned against me. Righteous. I can put it under the blood. And I can judge you righteous because of the blood. And be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as Christ forgave you. Let's just go to Ephesians 5, 1, which is just the next verse. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. And walk in love as Christ also has loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Let's read that again. Let's be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us an offering. Walk in love as Christ. So to walk in love as Christ, let's just break this down. To walk in love as Christ also has loved us. So to walk in love, I'm going to have to willing to offer myself or sacrifice myself. Can I tell you, you won't always get what you deserve, thank God. But can I tell you, you won't always get what you deserve when it's right. Can I tell you, when somebody, you don't deserve to be talked that way. Well, you're right. You're right about that. But can I tell you, to walk in love the way that Christ loved and gave himself as an offering, a sacrifice. Lord, I'm, I'm laying this down. To walk worthy of a vocation to which you've been called. Can I tell you that the love of God, even in Proverbs it talks about when you bring a soft answer. It talks about heaping coals on another's head. Turn, not only turning away wrath, but there's, there's coals. What is the coals? The coals isn't like, yeah, I'm going to coal, put coals on your head. It, like, I'm going to make you hurt. I'm going to burn your hair. No, no. It's going to clarify conscience. It's going to purify your conscience. So when you have, if you were to tell me off or say something to me, and I'm say, buddy, I'm sorry, uh, I'll, I'll do better next time, okay? What I just put into play was a spiritual law by coming under, right? The, the grace could abound, and grace put coals or a fire, a purifying fire, where somebody, all of that, now there, there's a clarity of conscience to respond and bring even bring repentance and not keep them in a place of, I'm not saying to clarify so that they can apologize to me. I'm talking about where they could clarify and repent. If they apologize to me, that's great. I already forgive them. I don't need an apology to forgive. And you don't either. If you are waiting on an apology, you're held captive by everyone else in the world. And you're chained up when you're supposed to be doing a job. You've been summoned, but you're tied down. I would like to come, but I can't because... What did you do with what I gave you? I gave you a gift. I gave you a grace. Remember, I won it back when, I, when you were held captive. I took captive that which captivated you and ha- held you captive. And I, not only did I take him captive and led him away, but I came and I gave you gifts. What did you do with the talents and the gifts I gave unto you? Well, my hands were tied because I was kind of tied up with what was going on here. Thank you, Lord. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children, Ephesians 5, 1, and walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. So what do you think about it? I don't. James chapter 4, 11 through 12. Brothers, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him uh, speaks against the law and judges it. If you judge the law, you are not a practor, practicer of the law, but a judge of it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy, 
But who are you to judge your brother? I, I, the way I have it written in my Bible, and you are not it. There is only one lawgiver, there's only one judge, and you are not it. So he tells us, don't slander, don't tell. Don't. Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2, 1 through 4. You therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment. Romans chapter 2, 1 through 4. You therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on another. For on whatever grounds you judge the other, you are condemning yourself. Because you who pass judgment do the very same things. And we know that the God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So let me say it this way. Could your judgment not be based on truth? Absolutely. Can I tell you, it's the most it's craziest thing. Uh, we were talking about this with, about hunting with, my, with one of my buddies, and I'm going to try to get, oh, good, I'm going to be wrapping up here in a little bit. So um, I was talking to hunting buddies, and, um, and uh, I said, you know, it's crazy how when somebody tells you something, even if it's not true, because you heard something first, it's going to take a lot to overcome that. So I, I said this. I said, so if, if you heard through the grapevine or through Facebook that I was sleeping with my secretary, and I came and said, hey, guys, da, 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 but I, I didn't, you didn't tell me. You didn't address that, okay? But you heard that, and I just act like everything's cool and normal, and just because of that one word, I'm going to, there's going to have to, unless you ask, I'm going to have, there's going to have to be overwhelming evidence for you to ju- judge it not right. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, it's amazing what you, you and I hear first, what you and I hear first. Therefore, you have no excuse. You pass judgment on one another. For whatever grounds you judge another, you're condemning yourself. And the only reason any of those th- kind of things could make sense is this. Because you recognize that you could be capable of the same thing. Can I tell you that that's why you can pass judgment on somebody? Because you could see how you could do that in... That's the reality. Otherwise, what, whatever said would have no grounds for truth in your, in, your, in your mind. I can't believe somebody would do that. Uh, maybe not do it, but you thought about that. I heard a test, uh, not a testimony, uh, somebody's story about somebody that has a girl and he has another girl. So he's a guy that's married, but he's married to one, but has another second one. And I remember being in high school wishing that could be the case. Oh, you think I'm sick? Like being an adult or being a, a guy that has a girl and has another girl. Be like, hey, I mean, David liked it. Solomon loved it. Concubine, concubine, concubine. So don't, don't tell me that, can I tell you this? You have a flesh. Can I tell you what that's called? Flesh. If anybody's heart is beating here, you have something called flesh. And flesh can't be trusted. It's extremely, not only, it, it's, it's flesh. It's not even carnal. Carnal is the way you operate. But flesh is evil. Flesh has evil desires. Flesh has animalistic instincts. Anything you could think or do, it's on you. And the only reason you and I don't act on certain things is because a different word has found us. It could have been your mom and dad saying, well, that's just wrong. And so that's just wrong, even though you're thinking about it, and so now you just think you're wrong. Anyway. Is, is anybody in here ever thought a bad thought besides me? Like when I was a kid, this is, what, this, is, this is what called me into doing what I'm doing now. Seventh grade, sitting on the front row of a church, Pastor Mac walking by thinking, oh, Lord, I, I don't think I did something. I know I didn't. I know I wasn't thinking right. I know I'm not thinking right about the girl that's sitting next to me. You think he, which is my wife uh, now. But let me tell you, I was, my thoughts were not wife-like. I mean, they were wife-like, and I wasn't married, all right? Anyway, and I just remember thinking, oh, I, don't, I, I, I'm, I know I'm not right. I know I'm not right. And, and this lady comes and tells me what God is saying about me. I couldn't believe it, but yet I could receive it. And where I received it, then faith came. See, there's things that you can't, you can't believe about you, but, but when it's said, there's a planting of the word, and you go, wow. 
Faith comes by the, okay. I, and, I, and, I, and I received that word. In that receiving of that word, it changed my life. Because God said something to me that was different than what I had seen about myself. Anyway. Verse 2, we know that God's judgment on those who do such things based on truth. So when you, O oh man, pass judgment on another, yet you do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you? And this is so, this is so big. This is so big to preach Jesus. Everyone in the house, everywhere in the world, this is where getting to, if, we don't, if we can't get this right here. Or do you disregard the riches of his kindness? God's kindness. His tolerance. Oh, God's not tolerant. Well, he's pretty patient. He's pretty kind. He came for the world while we were yet sinners. Not to condemn it, but to make a way. To pay for some pretty ugly things. Anybody got some skeletons in the closet? They haven't told anybody even though your closet's empty, but maybe like your past closet? Like, you know, the one that's been washed white as snow, but still in your mind, you could maybe bring up something about what you did or you didn't do or. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Can I tell you? In that. God's patience was at work. And his kindness. And can I tell you this? It was his kindness that led you to repentance. Isn't that what it says? Can I tell you, it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. And until I own God's kindness towards me, I'll never be able to extend it towards somebody else. And I won't be able to speak the truth in and therefore administer grace. Standing on the street corner and yelling at somebody doesn't work. God's grace isn't there. Jesus didn't pull out any of any scripture, it is written, to talk to the woman caught in the act of adultery. He didn't pull out any scripture, just anyone that he wanted to use. Uh, the ad- adulterers will go to hell. He could have said that to the woman at the well. <laughs> Fornicators, go to hell. He could have pulled that one out. But he didn't pull these out. Why? Because the word of God it, it, that you're, you and I are to carry is the ministry of his spirit, a ministry of reconciliation. To be reconciled to God because of Jesus Christ who paid a price for that sin. Can I tell you, all of man knows what sin is. They know. They they know. I know. You know when you're, you know. The Bible tells us that it was written on the law of our hearts. God did that. I, I don't have to tell you that's wrong. You know. You can come to a place where you're past feeling, Okay. And your conscience is so seared, but you still know that that's wrong. Okay? Or do you disregard the richness of his kindness, tolerance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness led you to repentance? Thank you, Lord. So Proverbs 16, 20, we've got four more scriptures, and, and we'll be uh, at the end here. Proverbs 16, 21. The wise in heart will be called prudent, and the sweetness of lips increases learning. Have you ever heard God talk to you when you're a wayward off? It's not a big stick. It's sweetness. Can I tell you that I'm not, uh, that's not just my testimony? That's how God has come to all of mankind. Behold, I stand at the door and I've got my foot back. Slam it in. Is that what he does? No. What does he do? Sometimes we would want to pound it down. Maybe you'd want to pound it down for your kids. Maybe you'd want to pound it down for whatever. Can I tell you the pounding doesn't work? Can I tell you the knocking? Can I tell you it's the sweetness of the lips that increases learning? Can I tell you it's a soft answer? This is one of those things like, you want to teach your kids? You can't teach them like this. I'm trying to teach you because I love you. Right? You can't, it, you know what happens there? Sweetness of the lips increases learning. You want your kids to learn something? Get sweet. Yeah, well, that's just, I, maybe, maybe that's not who you were, but there's a grace for you to be sweet. Because God's been gracious with, 
to you. So we can't despise his kindness. Despising his kindness stops everyone here from doing the thing above, preaching Jesus. When I despise his kindness, I'll look at impossible situations and say that they deserve it. Or, or th- instead of realizing his kindness, I won't have good news. Because I'm looking at everything that I see instead of just back at what God's done in me and how he paid a price. And I can be reconciled because of a price paid in the blood of Jesus. Reconciliation is a ministry given to me that was through redemption. Because Jesus paid the price. So I need a soft answer. I need not only a soft answer, I need sweetness so that knowledge could be imparted. Or so that understanding, so that learning could come. You know, you could say it like this. Are you, at, you ever maybe, you, <laughs> hey, honey, can you take out the trash? Yeah, you bet. Will you take out the trash? Are you asking me or are you telling me? Because the results will be two different things. <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about? Are you asking me? Hey, grab that real quick. Are you asking me or are you telling me? How many of you know tone matters? I, I'm talking to myself here, Okay. This is the pot calling the kettle black. I, I know. Because they're, you know, you can blame it on your upbringing. You can blame it on your history. But bottom line, can we establish this? It's your choice. Can I establish that? That was my choice. You know what that means? I can make a choice. Otherwise, I'm stuck in a past. Otherwise, I'm stuck in a hurt. Otherwise, I'm stuck. But God gave me a choice. So it's the sweetness of the lips that increases learning. Proverbs 30, 33, as for the churning of milk produces butter. Did you all know that? You know? <laughs> and the wringing of a nose produces blood. So the forcing of wrath produces strife. Or the, the forcing of an issue. You ever just not drop it? I'm pretty, I've done that before. You know, you're trying to, what I'm trying to say, no, no, no. And then you said it this way, and then you try to say it this way, and you're trying to say it this way, and all you're looking for is a response. All you're looking for is an, uh, like maybe a, a yielding to, but instead there's a bucking up. If you, and so, well, okay, you're going to buck. I'll come up this way, and then I'll come this way, and then and it doesn't ever work until, until, <sighs> sorry about that. I didn't handle that right. Will you forgive me? Will you forgive me? Um, I'm trying to make a turn here. I'm trying to turn towards God. But those who had God turn towards them are holding me from making that turn because they're holding me still in this turn. And I'm trying to turn this way. I'm to, will, you, will you forgive me? Will you let me turn? Will you let me turn for my... Will you let me turn? I'm trying to turn. we got to let people turn. we got to let people turn. we got to let the world turn. Can I tell you, when you're, when you're born again and when you give your life to Christ, can I tell you, your, your, your spirit saved, but there's an outworking of salvation? Can we let them turn? Can we forgive one another? Can we be patient? Can we forbear with one another in love? And can we not despise God's patience and his tolerance and his kindness? I'm not preaching this morning that, oh, sin doesn't matter. I'm preaching sin was paid for. And until we establish that and it was paid for for me, I'll never be able to extend the love of God and the kindness of God that leads to the turnaround to the walking out. The turning around and the walking out never happens by willpower. And if you think that's the case, you're probably not saved. Because your trust is in yourself instead of his righteousness and in his blood. Yes, there is something called sanctification. How we're changed from one degree of glory to the next as we behold him in the mirror. But can I tell you, sometimes we're the biggest hindrance from allowing somebody else to see the word because all they can see is us and our judgment instead of what God says. So we wonder why there's not a change. Because I'm, what they're seeing is not the reflection of God's kindness. And I'm talking about in the house first to carry out of the house. 
You tell me. Oh, thank you, Lord. So let's go here. Colossians 3, 13 through 15. Therefore, as an elect of God, holy and beloved, clothe yourself and your hearts with compassion. Put on the love of God, kindness. Put on humility. Put on gentleness. Could you just see yourself doing that? Maybe you struggle to be gentle. Just put it on. Just wear the coat of gentleness. Wear the coat of kindness. Wear the coat, I'm just not patient. I'm just not patient. Okay, if you say so, because it's your choice. You can put on some patience. I'm going to put on some patience and bear one another and forgive any complaint you may have against someone else. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which is the bond of perfect unity. It's the bond where God's presence and His blessing is commanded, a place of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, for to this you were called as members of one body, and be thankful. And be thankful. One body, and be thankful. Have you ever got on a gripe session? Can I tell you, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience comes a whole lot easier in thankfulness? In thankfulness? I'm thankful that God called me here. I'm thankful that God... I'm, thank, I'm, I'm thankful for this. I'm th- I know that there was this, but I'm, I'm thankful that I... I have something pretty valuable if the enemy is wanting to attack it. Ephesians 2, 13 through 18. But now, in Christ Jesus, you were once afar off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. One new man from the two, this side and this side. Can I tell you that's what God's heart is for the church? Where there's this side, where there's this side, where there's a partition here and there's a partition here. He wants to take down that wall and he wants to take and make one from the two. Can I tell you he wants to make more than one from two? He wants to make one from a whole lot of people. To do what? To carry out his plan on the earth, the ministry of reconciliation. To see people reconciled to God. And he came, verse 17, And preached peace to you. You who were afar off. And to those who were near. For through him we have access by one spirit to the Father. 1 Timothy 2, 5-6. There is one God. There is one mediator between God and men. The man Christ Jesus. Who gave himself as a ransom for all. The testimony that was given at just the right time. We'll close with this verse. Luke chapter 6, 35 through 36. Again, this is reconciliation because of redemption. Everyone. Everyone in the house. Preaching Jesus. Everyone in the house. Let's preach Jesus in the house. Let's light the light. Let's light the light. Let's light a candle in the house. Let's not have it not under a bushel. Let's not have it within walls. Let's have unity be the bond of peace between us. Let's have the Lord commanding his blessing. Let's remember what Jesus paid the price. And then let's do this right here. But love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them. Expect nothing in return. Then your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. For He is kind. This is that same mercy. Do you despise the kindness of God, not knowing it's the kindness of God? That, and be kind. Or you know, He says, and, and you will be sons of the Most High. For He is kind to the ungrateful and to the wicked. It matters, our kindness, to the ungrateful, to the wicked, to the undeserving. Can I tell you I was undeserving? And he says this. So not only is he kind to the ungrateful and wicked, he now says, and you, be merciful, compassionate. Be merciful, compassionate. This is the the definition of merciful. Be compassionate. Experience deep pity. Lamentation. Even lamentate. What does it mean to lamentate? To weep over. 
Can I tell you, there's people that are broken? That are making choices because they're broken? Can I tell you that the identity the, and, and, the, and, and the wrapping up and trying to find out who they are is just trying to find out a place they could be celebrated and accepted? And, and there's cutting down and there's this and there's this. I'm not calling homosexuality righteous. I'm talking about God reaching down because He loves you and me because of love. Can I tell you, hurt causes us to do some crazy things. But be merciful, compassionate, experiencing deep pity, lamentate, weep over. Why? There's got to be a reason. You know, in 1 Corinthians 13, it says this, after it talks about what love is, it says, right now we see through a glass darkly. And one translation says, it's as if a riddle. But one day we're going to see it open and clear. A riddle means this, I'm saying this and I'm saying this, but really I'm meaning this. I'm saying this and this is what you're seeing and this is what you're doing, but really there's an underlying different story. He says, right now we see through a glass darkly as if it was a riddle, but one day it'll be open and clear. So he says this, love. He says this, love everyone in the house so you can carry it to the world. Be merciful, compassionate, experiencing deep pity. Lamentate as God has for his people. As God has for people who look for him for help in their difficult situation. Just as your father is merciful. Verse 36 without the interjected definition. And you, be merciful just as your father is merciful. You're not doing it just... For them you're doing it for him because you are what he sent to preach him in the earth a way when there was no way his righteousness for our sins if it doesn't start with one another it'll never go beyond these four walls and we will be hindered from Preaching, though we desire to be used by him, will be hindered from preaching it ourselves. We'll keep it in here, and it needs to go everywhere in the world. Amen. Let's stand. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Just close your eyes this morning. Father, we just stand here before you. Any place that there's a wall or we've allowed a partition to be built, enmity or a division, just out of a, a sign of acknowledging where there was a wall, we, I, I lift my hands. If that's you, if there's a, any wall where you have a wall, it might be between your mom and dad, it might be between a friend, it might be between a loved one. I want you to lift your hand just to him, both hands. Eyes, I, eyes bowed, I, I, our heads bowed, eyes closed. And Father, we lift this to you as to Jesus, the mediator. And we're asking you to speak to us and to show us your kindness, your goodness, and to tear down the wall. Tear down the wall between us. A work of the heart, a work of your word that brings correction and sets into place where we've tried to set it right for so long. A work of your word. You're the great physician. You're the healer of hearts, the healer and the restorer of souls. And you can put back straight. And you can mend and restore. And you can put flesh on that which seems to be gone. We're asking you for walls this morning to be tore down. And for a oneness and a unity to be in your house in our relationships 
put on our eyes a veil that we'd look through your blood, that we'd look through the gift of your son Jesus as we look at others. Thank you. And we choose today. We choose your way. We choose you. We choose you. Thank you for that choice. Thank you for that choice. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, or you've never made Jesus Lord of your life, you don't know where you'd spend eternity if your life was required today, I want to give you an opportunity to just make Jesus your Lord. The Bible says if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, you would be saved. If that's you, I just want to take a moment and go, go ahead and lift your hand, bold and clear, that you want to give your life to Jesus. Thank you, honey. Thank you for your hands. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your hand, sister. Another one. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. And is there anybody else? Is there anybody else? Thank you, bud. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Will you, will you make your way forward? Will you come on, come on down? I want, to, I want to pray with you down here. I think it's important that you hear that God, how much God loves you. Come on down, young men and young ladies. Don't be, don't be shy. This will be one of the most powerful things that you do. This will be one of the most, most powerful things you do. Come on down. Come on with them. Yeah, come on. Because even if it's settling in your heart, even if it's settling in your heart, uh, questions of your tomorrow. Thank you, Lord. Okay. Thank you, Lord. You can come on. It's okay. How about you, young man? You want to come? Be bold. Come on. Let's give him a hand. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. God loves you. God loves you. What's your name, buddy? Lathan? Like with an L? I'm with an N. Nathan. Lathan. That's awesome. What's your name, honey? Abby? Abby? Thank you, Lord. Can we just, can I just pray with you guys? You know, God loves you. He loves you. And he has good plans for you. And even you coming and taking a step to come up here today, I believe that you're going to there's going to be a boldness on you to take a step according to what God has for your life. There's some good things He has for your tomorrow. And you can't be, you're not to be hidden. Can I tell you this? You're not to be hidden. You're too great of a gift to be hidden. Both of you. Can I just pray a prayer with you? Just say this with me. Say, Father, I love you because you love me. you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for me. I'm valuable because you said I am. Take my life. Use it for your glory. Shine through me in Jesus' name. Thank you that I hear your voice and the strangers I don't follow. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you just for light on these paths and a brightness. In the name of Jesus, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you, Kyle. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Whole families swept in. Whole families swept in. There will be many, many people come to Christ. Not just in this house, but through these people. Not just in this house, but through these people. Because we're preaching Jesus. We're preaching Jesus. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Have a great week. We'll see you on Wednesday night.